I went out and got the only man with brains enough to replace the body. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Hey friends, how are we doing? Welcome to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I am a professional artist and educator attempting to bring you the absolute best in art historical content and videos. Why are you here? As always, I appreciate likes, shares, and new subscribers. You ain't gonna do shit. So today's video is a bit of a reboot based upon the request of a viewer. I'm just dying to know. My YouTube student, Amy, had this question for me. Could you please expand on the several other figures, specifically the bearded men and the man wearing a large hat in the back left of the painting? I don't know. That's a good question. So today we're going to oblige her request, dive a little bit deeper into the artist's studio by Corbet, and see who these individuals are inside this great painting from the uh, from the Romantic era. Dun, dun, dun! As we see here, the painting is divided up into three sections, the left, the right, the middle, and uh, each section has kind of got its own thing. Uh, you can go back to another video that I did. It's linked down below. You can check that one out, and that kind of focuses on Corbet and a lot of the history of this painting and, and what kind of brought it to uh, to importance. But this one is just going to focus on the individuals in the painting. But if you want a little bit deeper information on the uh, the background of the painting and all of that, check that one out. But let's first look at what was happening on the left hand side of this painting. As noted, I created a video about this some time ago. And here's what I had to say at that time about the figures on the left. The figures in the painting are allegorical representations of various influences on Corbet's artistic life. On the left are the figures of his hometown roots. It's also safe to say that this is a reflection of the everyday people living in Paris. According to Corbet's notes, the Jewish man and the Irish woman were based on sketches that he made during a trip to London in 1848. Other figures represented are the Undertaker, the Poacher, a mannequin representing the crucifixion, as well as several other figures. So just to expand on that a little bit, the title itself is a bit of a quandary because it's a real allegory. So you have no frame of reference here, Donnie. You're like a child who wanders into Walter, the middle of a movie and wants to Walter. Things that are real aren't allegories, and allegories aren't real. So in the subtitle, a real allegory summing up seven years of my artistic and moral life. He's showing us glimpses of real people, but also depictions of people that are more symbolic than actual people. So many of the people can't specifically be identified as someone specific. These are the good people and the bad people. And as Corbet said, the exploited and the exploiters. So as we look through the individuals in the upper left, again as mentioned, we start here in the upper left, where the individual is identified typically as the Jewish man, sometimes the priest. Now, far in the back is an individual that is unrecognized, or at least I could not find any relationship or any information on the allegory that he represents. Now, the next man over in this grouping of three men is a representation of the village idiot. Come on! As we slide down to the foreground, we see the poacher, sometimes called the hunter. Now the poacher is represented by the likeness of Napoleon III. Now what do I know? I color for a living, but I do know that Napoleon III and Corbet were not friends, and here's why. And we must remember that this is a work that in its title says that it's based on seven years time. So 1855, back seven years, we go to 1848, and that is critical to this particular allegory of the poacher. Prior to 1848, France was a republic, and Napoleon III seizes power, becoming emperor of France, taking land that does not belong to him. He poaches the land. 
He takes what's not his. And so he is depicted in this way, in a disguised fashion, with his hunting dogs at tow. Okay, I can see that. Moving backwards, the man in the white shirt is oftentimes labeled as the woodsman. This was a time that Paris was being expanded and the woodsmen would be responsible for clearing the trees so that infrastructure could be expanded and the city could be expanded. The other two men in secession, I have no idea what they represent or what their allegory is. However, as we move forward, the man whose back is to us is oftentimes labeled as the merchant selling his wares to others. Which leaves the question in my mind, is he the exploited or the exploiter? I would imagine Corbet had an opinion on this as he is doing business with a couple of gentlemen there whose allegory is also a bit of a mystery. Continuing to the right, the man in the top hat, as mentioned, is the undertaker. Rest in peace. And behind him, we see a female figure and a highly shadowed male figure. Well, the female is a prostitute, and the man is the John to the prostitute. Continuing to the front, we see the crucified model figure, which is a symbol of death of the art of the Royal Academy of the Arts in France. It is a death of the arts in the mind of Courbet, further emphasized by the Vanitas figure of the skull sitting at its feet, and the symbol of poverty, the Irish woman feeding her baby. Mm-hmm, that's right. Now in the center we have three figures and a cat. Let's take a look at what's going on there. Here's what I had to say about that previously. In the center, Corbet is working on a landscape with his back turned to a nude model, which is a symbol of academic art. The female figure is based on an 1854 photograph, and he is one of the first to utilize photography as a way to gather studies and source material. The landscape itself very much represents his homeland. The boy to Corbet's left is a reference to innocence. The boy is looking up to Corbet, with his clogged shoes and torn up shirt, the boy's youth and perhaps even his poverty make him pure. Courbet believed that urban life and sophistication distanced the artist from the truth of nature. It was his goal to return to the pure and redirect his sight through those of the eyes of a child. And lastly, the cat, often seen as a symbol of independence or liberty. I think I pretty much covered what I needed to cover in that first video in terms of these central figures. However, I would also quickly like to note that the photo that was taken of the muse or sometimes seen as the naked truth was a photograph by J.V. de Villeneuve, a notable painter, lithographer, and photographer who was introduced to Courbet in the 1850s and would utilize his skills in photography to help him enhance many of his paintings going forward. You know what? The only thing I am worried about is getting a boner. Now on the right hand side we're at the elite Parisian society. Let's dive a little bit deeper and there's a lot more names associated with the individuals on this section than we find in the other two. And here's what I said about that. Of course, you can always go back and watch that full video as well, but here you go. On the right are his friends and patrons, mainly elite Parisians that he would meet during his professional career. The majority of these portraits are copied from other portraits that he had created or from photographs. On the right-hand side, we see the stakeholders, the friends, the colleagues, and the art lovers. Now, as we move left to right across the frame, Again, the first figure is completely unknown what the allegory or who the individual is. But the next individual is Alfred Bruges, who is a prominent art collector who bought several pieces of Courbet's work. To his left, the next individual over, is Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who was a very prominent politician, philosopher, and the first person ever to label himself as an anarchist. The next two men to his left are also unknown, however, an individual who would write under the pen name Champ Fleury. 
a French art critic and novelist who very much supported the realist movement and financially supported Courbet. Now behind him, those are the free lovers. They represent the individuals that are in love and willing to show it. And the next couple over, they represent the art lovers. The people that are willing to invest and just have a passion for viewing art. Now it is believed that the woman in this picture is Christine Unger. She was an Austro-Hungarian opera singer who very much had a passion for the visual arts. Her husband is Francois Sibiete, who would change his last name to Sibiete Younger after they were married. You'd keep your mouth shut if you knew it was good for you, buddy. At their feet is a child, which is some sort of an allegory about the creative instincts of children. Between the art lovers and the last character in the painting, we see this ghost-like, grayed-out figure. Actual physical contact! Now this grayed-out figure is very much connected with the last character who is holding this book. This is none other than famous poet Charles Baudelaire, a very good friend of Courbet. And as the painting was being developed, because they were close friends, Corbet knew his girlfriend mistress of the time, who was a mixed-raced female, and Baudelaire believed it would have been scandalous to have included her in that next to him, and so he told his friend to remove her, which he obliged to do for his friend. But we see her still kind of poking out of the background, and that is a little bit more in-depth look at the individuals within Courbet's Artist Studio Masterpiece from 1855. <laughs> oh man, I love that story. Good night, Critter!